Bible seminar today, and today's speaker is Dr. Ganga Hedi Arashi, and she is one of the world's leading scientists in the field of trace metal and nutrient chemistry in soils. Uh, her research at uh, Kansas State focuses on understanding the chemistry of both nutrient and contaminant elements in soils uh, with the goal of developing solutions to agricultural or environmental problems. And today she has a presentation entitled Manipulating Reaction Pathways to Optimize Soil Nutrient Availability. And with that, I will um, uh, let Ganga share her screen and, and begin. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yeah, good. Um, so thank you for uh, giving me opportunity to uh, share my research. And I'm going to focus on how we can manipulate reaction pathways to optimize uh, soil nutrient availability. So the um, before we, I start, I uh, would like to acknowledge the contributors and collaborators of my research work, uh, starting from my graduate students and uh, various co-PIs at uh, Kansas State and other, other places. My talk, I am going to um, uh, just uh, uh, give you an outline. I will uh, give a brief introduction and then uh, focus on can we manipulate soil nutrient cycles? And I will first talk about nitrogen and then move to phosphorus and then uh, talk about micronutrients taking zinc as an example and then uh, summarize at the end. So the, when we are talking about nutrients, we know that the uh, macronutrients and micronutrients provide vital support to human life. So application of nutrients to agriculture system has resulted in unprecedented increase in yield. So we do know that it's uh, not only uh, a help to sustain population growth and then uh, also improve the nutritional status of people. But at the same time, uh, the overloading nutrient with uh, our uh, overloading our soil systems with nutrients, we have unintended consequences of that. So if we uh, think about it, uh, so the environmental uh, concerns uh, due to over application of nutrients can be multiple scales. Uh, so the, the water pollution and air pollution in local and regional scale and the global climate change uh, like globally, global scale. So because of that, there's a greater need of, there's a, the, the huge challenge to manage uh, nutrients more sustainably. So if we look at uh, nitrogen, especially macronutrients, uh, the nitrogen and phosphorus, the human intervention is huge. So the, uh, if you look at the, uh, the application of uh, oh, the nitrogen input, the, especially the agricultural uh, nitrogen input, it, it increased from uh, the 1920s, like about uh, 20 teragrams of nitrogen per year to 2015 to 180 teragrams of nitrogen per uh, year. So similar story with phosphorus. So there's a recent review that uh, they pointed out that we actually crossed the anthropogenic and planetary boundary of nitrogen and phosphorus because of this application of or the, the, the human intervention uh, for these nutrient cycles. So here in this presentation, I'm going to talk about nitrogen, uh, phosphorus and micronutrients and see what are the ways that we can actually increase their efficiency, use efficiency, and uh, therefore bring closer to what we call as agronomic threshold and the environmental threshold, how we can do that. So can we manipulate the soil nitrogen cycle? So if we look at uh, soil nitrogen cycle, you can see the input 
So the various inputs starting from uh, the, the inorganic fertilizers, the organic manures, and then biological nitrogen fixation. So those are the big inputs. And then when we are looking at uh, uh, soil uh, reactions or the soil, uh, uh, the cycling part happening uh, for nitrogen. So if it, urea added, so the urea hydrolysis, and if it is added as ammonium fertilizer or the hydrolyzed urea, they go through nitrification. And then this nitrified, uh, uh, the, the nitrate in product of na nitrogen nitrate, most versatile form of nitrogen, the, the, the difficult to manage form. So that can leach out or can go through denitrification, uh, so forth. And then there are some other uh, uh, reaction pathways like NMOX and DNR, disseminatory nitrate uh, reduction, et cetera. And then in addition to the organic nitrogen decomposition or min, uh, the, the mineralization, and then the, the, the inorganic nitrogen converting into organic nitrogen. So those are the main pathways. So the, if we look at ways to deal with or the as like possible solutions, we can look at the, the starting from the urea hydrolysis and then the nitrification process. We can think of actually focus on slow and controlled release formulations. So the, uh, uh, that's one way of dealing with it. And then the, another way is co-application of urea or ammonia, ammonium nitrogen fertilizers with urease or nitrification inhibitors. So the idea over here is slowing down urea hydrolysis uh, by urease inhibition and then show, slowing down nitrification by nitrification inhibitors and translating uh, uh, this into greater nitrogen plant efficiency by synchronize the, 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 the available forms of nitrogen better synchronized and better positions with plants to access when plants need it. So that's, that's the idea of uh, uh, this, that is one way of doing that. So here the, in this example, this is um, looking at ammonia volatilization loss uh, and core nitrogen nutrition and productivity uh, with efficiency enhanced UAN and urea under no tillage. And as you can see over here that the depending on application method. So if it is surface applied, you can see that the, the, here the uh, inhibitor is in uh, BPT. And then the NBPT, the effect of NBPT, significant effect of NBPT can be realized where we have most losses of uh, nitrogen as ammonia. So when, when UAN is applied, like surface applied, and you do not see that much when it is knifed in, whether you are applying it alone or whether you are applying with the UDS inhibitor. So, uh, so with that, uh, uh, here the nitrification inhibitors and nitrogen nutrition, so the nitropyrene, that's the most commonly used nitrification inhibitor started using it in uh, 1970s. And then still the issue with most of these uh, inhibitors, the lack of specificity. And then sometimes we say that they are, they are, they are uh, uh, actually they are specific to them, uh, specific to ammonium oxidation. And sometimes it, it's not, they can be specific to other things and they may be uh, interfering with other processes. And then as well as lack of understanding of mechanisms. Although we have been using these for years, we, have, we don't have complete understanding of how they are reacting in soil. And then lack of understanding of environmental effects, including effect of the, these on soil microorganisms. So the more uh, the recent nitrification inhibitor is pro-nitridine. Pro and then again, uh, the, the, we, we suspect that this is how it is working, but at the same time, the, the specificity of it 
and the effect of that on the uh, soil, other soil microorganisms, we, we do not know, or the soil processes, we do not know. So considering these uh, things, uh, there can be other options to do this. So the temporary inhibition of either urease activity or the, the nitrification ammonia oxidation may be achieved by micronutrients. So co-applying micronutrients with uh, urea. So for example, this uh, field observation, this study is from Australia uh, in Mali sandy soil. It's, it's uh, almost like pure, uh, I mean, very, uh, very high sand. And when we are looking at this grain yield in tons per hectare, and then remember that uh, over there, they are growing wheat and then the, their wheat yields are very, very low in these soils. And these soils show uh, uh, almost everywhere show um, response to nitrogen. Nitrogen seems to be the limiting factor. And then when we compare these 2015 and 2016 field results, you can see that the 20N with zinc was equivalent to 40N uh, urea. So the just applying urea, the half the urea with zinc was giving the similar kind of yield as 40 nitrogen. So, and then when they were looking at the 20N urea with foliar zinc or zinc oxide powder, they did not see this similar effect. So this, this, the, the, the co-application, co-location, telling us that co-location matters. So we do have currently experiments going on to understand the mechanisms of this. And then also, what are the other trace elements that, or the micronutrients that are capable of doing this? So if you are familiar with the early uh, mid 70s work done by Dr. Tabata Bayad, Iowa State University, and he looked at the effect of trace elements, especially the effect of trace elements in the, the sewage sludge applied soils on various enzyme activities. So we can suspect that the, these micronutrients, not only co-applying micronutrients with urea, not only uh, applying micronutrients, but also temporarily slowing down these processes and thereby allowing these nitrogen fertilizers to better synchronize with plant need. So another opportunity is co-crystallization technology. It is uh, something like uh, looking at urea. So urea, we know that it's highly hygroscopic, very soluble. So we do have challenges with the shelf life we do have challenges with transportation and things like that. So the, because of that, we can think of this co-crystallization technology, co-crystallize this without changing the molecular structure, co-crystallize with another uh, uh, molecule, which has different characteristics. So that the co-crystal will be, in this case, for fertilizer, but especially when it comes to urea, we want it to be it to have lower solubility, so that we can think of better synchronizing with uh, plant uptake. And th this co-crystallization technology has application in like medicine, so the 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 cancer treatments and things like that. In cases like that, if you look at it, the reason could be actually opposite of it. If we look at most of those ca cancer treating agents, uh, th those organic molecules are not soluble in water. So that the co-crystallization technology can actually help to enhance their solubility and so that better deliver those uh, treatments. So, so we can use that similar in like agricultural sciences. So here in this example, this is uh, done by uh, Dr. Krista Karoui in our chemistry department and his students and modulating the physical properties of solid forms of uh, uh, urea using co-crystallization technology. So they de uh, uh, did use two uh, things to do the co-crystallization of urea with urea uh, pimelic acid 
and then urea for nitrophenol. So as you can see that the, the, with the uh, pimeric acid, the, it uh, decreased the solubility 23 fold. And then with the uh, nitrophenol, it decreased the uh, solubility 66 fold. So that the, the greater effect. So currently we are collaborating, the his lab and our lab, uh, we are collaborating to see that how these co-crystals going to behave in soil. So in, uh, I'm going to uh, briefly show uh, results from preliminary results from two ongoing uh, products that we are testing uh, at the moment. That one is bis urea succinic acid. I'm going to call it as BUS and then the 4-nitrophenol urea NPU. So in this study, uh, uh, we had four treatments con controlled, uh, nothing added, and then the urea added as urea crystals and then the, the BAS and NPU, same amount of nitrogen in each of these treatments, five replicates, four treatments and three incubation uh, periods. So uh, just to show that the, uh, how the experiment was set up, pack pre-moist soil to achieve desired bulk density, added water to bring the water content to 50% of maximum water holding capacity and incubate those overnight and then introduce treatments in the center, few millimeters below the surface. And then the dishes were closed and uh, see, uh, secured with parafilm. And then these dishes were put it in a larger dishes with uh, the, 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 as you can see that the ring of uh, sponge with boric acid, that is to capture any ammonia release. Then the petri, large petri dishes were closed and then sealed those and then incubated those for two days, one week uh, or five weeks. So the, at the end of uh, incubation period, so uh, the petri dishes were sections as, uh, to, into four sections, starting from the center, zero to 7.5 millimeters, 7.5 to 13.5, 13.5 to 25.5, and then the rest. So the, the, those were carefully removed and then uh, did the measurements for extractable nitrogen, pH, and uh, uh, we'll be doing other things. And at the same time, the, the sponge was recovered and then the, uh, uh, we use uh, KCL to extract the uh, boric acid captured ammonia and then measured that as well. So uh, just to show over here in general, in this uh, particular soil, although the pH was higher, the ammonia volatilization was very minimal, so less than 1% of added uh, 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 nitrogen. And then uh, when we are comparing the crystal urea and then the bus and NPU, and it was clear that the ammonia volatilization was lower in those cool crystals. And Looking at the uh, extractable nitrogen in these uh, four sections, so the blue section, uh, the first intersection where we applied uh, nitrogen is the uh, blue, and then the next second one is red, uh, followed by green and the purple. So uh, this is showing two days and the five weeks incubation. And then uh, here you can see that the transformation to ammonium and nitrate was slower for NPU treatment compared to other, compared to urea and BAS. It seems like actually BAS enhanced the hydrolysis instead of decreasing it. So the, 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 looking at the, the solubility reduction that they checked in the chemistry lab, versus testing those in real soil. So you can see the importance of actually producing these kind of things and then testing that in soil to see whether it is behaving as we expected in the laboratory, like a beaker situation. So with that, I am moving to phosphorus and can we manipulate fertilizer phosphorus reaction pathways in soils? to answer that question. So if we look at the, uh, uh, the just a simple uh, phosphorus uh, cycle in soil. So we have fertilizer P, animal manure. Those are the additions of phosphorus to uh, soil. And then the depending on uh, uh, phosphorus, whether it is organic or the, the inorganic, 
the, it will end up in soil solution or as organic pea. And if it end up as organic pea, it need to go through mineralization to come to soil solution. So the soil solution, we do have otopy species and other soluble phosphorus species. And then here, there can be, depending on soil properties, there can be various sorption reactions. The, the chemisorption of uh, these otopy or the precipitation of, if, if environment is conducive, precipitation of uh, these uh, otopy. So those are the sorption reactions, main sorption reactions. And then the phosphorus leaching is soluble phosphorus leaching is uh, not uh, that great in most cases. So what are the opportunities? We, the manipulations that we can do in the soil P cycle when we look at soil P cycles. So we can look at ways to in the, the slow down or we change these sorption reactions. So manipulation can be done by fertilizer formulations. So rather than example, rather than using O2P based fertilizers, maybe use, using poly P based fertilizers could create changes. I, I, I will uh, discuss what kind of uh, uh, things we can uh, get and, and what type of soils we can actually achieve success by changing fertilizer formulations. So that's one example. And then the application method, banded versus like broadcast, for example. In, in some cases, broadcast may be better option than banding and vice versa. So depending on soil. So the next uh, thing is the, again, interfering with sorption processes by co-applying things that are capable of reacting with the cations that go into uh, and so, uh, cations that are going to react with phosphorus and make them unavailable, such as calcium, such as iron and alumina. So those are the, those are the opportunities when we look at soil pea cycle. So the the like I, uh, the other possible solutions, liquid versus granular phosphorus application, I'll talk about in a bit. And then the copolymer or humic substances with high cation exchange uh, capacity processing high affinity for polyvalent cations, like I said, aluminum, iron, and uh, calcium. Again, theoretically, some of these uh, can sound very good, but you, you have to try and see whether it is going to work. And then the co-application of these compound with fertilizer, that may inhibit immediate fixation, allowing phosphorus to diffuse further from the point of application. And this can be beneficial in some cases. So this will prevent or slowing down precipitation and favoring weak adsorption in soil and increasing volume and rich with phosphorus. And then this may uh, translate into greater pea plant acquisition efficiency. So here in uh, this uh, slide showing phosphorus availability in calcareous soil, these, these soils are highly calcareous soils in South uh, 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 Australia. Uh, when we say highly uh, uh, calcareous soil in South Australia, we are talking about 50 to 70, 80, 90% of calcium carbon. It can be very, very highly uh, calcareous. So in that kind of environment, here, uh, this field experiments looking at granular uh, monoammonium phosphate the applied at 15 kilogram per hectare. And then the, the liquid monoammonium phosphate, same uh, chemical applied as a uh, fluid or the liquid, same soil, same phosphorus rate, but you can see differential response. Yield increase when we use granular versus a liquid, yield increase, observed yield increase was up to about 20%. So there's a, a, the, the significant yield increase. So what is going on in uh, this, uh, 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 this situation? So we did a, a X-ray uh, microtomography work to understand what's going on. And here, this uh, the, the map granule was incubated in a small soil column. <clears throat> and then uh, they took the micro CT uh, scans 
uh, at like immediately after application and 24 hours after application. So the A is immediately after application and B is after 24 hours. And then you can see the changes in that. And then we can subtract these microtomograph uh, across the, uh, this is showing across the granule uh, microtomograph and get the differential microtomograph as you can see at the bottom. And then as you can see from that differential microtomogram, uh, the, you see that the granules actually lost the density. So that can be expected because as granules dissolve, they uh, lose the density. And then at the same time, you can see that the around, right around the granules, we have a higher dense area and then uh, compared to the rest of the soil. So you can see that same thing with when you are looking at the relative attenuation with the distance, the, the reduction in attenuation where the granule goes and increase right around the granule and then going down as you move away from the granule. So what is happening when you add these highly hygroscopic granules to highly calcareous soils? So the hygroscopic granules attract moisture towards them and then the soil moisture comes with calcium. They act almost granules act like a, a sponge. So the uh, so, so this water comes with calcium uh, because it's a highly calcareous soil. Then the precipitation reactions happen right around the granule. The dissolved phosphorus doesn't get that much chance to move uh, away from the granule. So what happened when we look at liquid? So here, the tomograms of the liquid fertilizer added introduced to the center and then the, the taking tomographs after, uh, right after adding and then 24 hours after. And then the differential tomogram is also shown at the bottom uh, uh, left. And then you can see that there's no change. Uh, there's no change and it's showing that it's just move and there are no additional precipitation reactions or something like what's going on with the granules. So that's the reason for increased efficiency of liquid fertilizer because liquid fertilizer moves without any uh, problem. So since it is moving away to a large soil volume, they are by decreasing the concentration of phosphorus and decreasing the chances of calcium P precipitation. So this was confirmed by Lombi et al. doing a, a synchrotron based X-ray uh, absorption near age structure stud, uh, spectroscopy study. So when we look at these, so the, the mon MAP stand for monoammonium phosphate. So we can see that the, the 0 to 7.5 millimeter is where the phosphorus was applied. So in the, uh, uh, if you are not familiar with the phosphorus uh, zine spectra and the calcium phosphate usually show a secondary shoulder. So the post edge shoulder. So you can see that in the map 0 to 7.5, you can see that distinctive calcium phosphate shoulder suggesting that there are significant amount of phosphorus exists as calcium phosphate. So if we look at the technical grade or the liquid monoammonium phosphate, the same soil section, you cannot see that clear calcium P shoulder. So the indicating that the calcium P formation with that treatment is less. Although it is monoammonium phosphate, but when you add it as a liquid. So we did actually, is it only, uh, 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 are these reactions only happening in highly calcareous soils? Or are these reactions can happen in soils? Can these reactions happen in soils that we have around us? So we did some experiments using uh, two calcareous soils, uh, several calcareous soils. Here I'm presenting data from two. In some of the calcareous soils from Kansas. The, the free calcium carbonate con concentration ranging from about seven to uh, about 11%. So here, the, the treatments are various, uh, the uh, phosphorus treatment, phosphoric acid, and then the phosphoric acid blend with uh, the subfraction of fulvic acid blend, blend and monoammonium phosphate. 
and then the monoammonium phosphate and this, the, the blend of uh, fulvic acid and ammonium polyphosphate and ammonium polyphosphate with blend of uh, this fulvic acid. Actually, we did not see any benefits of having fulvic acids uh, as a blend in the, uh, with these uh, treatments. However, when we are comparing ortho P sources and the poly P sources, we did see changes. So remember that the secondary, uh, the, the, that the post edge shoulder uh, unique for calcium P species. So you can see that the ortho P treatments have distinctive the calcium P shoulder, whereas when we are looking at ammonium polyphosphate added one, we do not see that. So the advantage of ammonium polyphosphate in these type of calcareous soils are due to two things. One thing, it is changing how phosphorus, added phosphorus go into partition into soil. And then also, even if calcium, phosphor, uh, calcium phosphate formed, it seems like the, to transform those into less soluble, more crystalline forms actually going to take longer. It, it retard the, the, the maturation of these calcium P uh, forms. So if you are interested in looking at, you can see more details in the publication. Uh, I'm not going to go into details. So here in this review paper, actually summarizing what are the mechanisms of actions utilized for exploration of enhanced phosphorus fertilizer acquisition efficiency. So starting from using alternative P sources. So in that, I mean use of P species other than orthophosphate, slow releases. So the reduction of phosphorus soil contact time and the surface area, and then the blockers. So that's the disruption of phosphorus precipitation or the inner sphere complexation or inducers like uh, the stimulation of plant micro P acquisition. And sometimes these inducers may not have phosphorus in them at all. Okay, so these are the ones that if we look at literature, these are the uh, things that work sometimes and then sometimes didn't work that much. So the this uh, goes into transition into smart fertilizers. So here, uh, this is like a smart delivery assistance. Uh, the, the, this is using, can be used for NPK, any fertilizer, even micronutrients if needed. So using advanced polymeric materials, so to, as a coating, so that they degrade under external stimulus, such as temperature changes, pH, and with water permeability. So that way achieving slow nutrient release. And then sometimes this encapsulation can be microorganisms as well. So that the, the again, design kind of like a testing uh, uh, stages. And here again, another uh, uh, example showing the urea core and then using this, the, uh, the hydrogel the aspartic acid based hydrogel. And then the idea is increasing water holding capacity as well as water retention at the same time, releasing the fertilizers like the coated fertilizers in the core of those coated uh, uh, ones like slowly. With that, I am uh, moving to transition into micronutrients. And then the, the, if you look at the micronutrients, the millions of hectares of arable land is deficient in available micronutrients. So here, this is a good example showing how well correlate the human and soil sink deficiency. What's the geographical overlap between these two? The soil deficient areas, you can see the human sink deficiency areas too. So to correct that, we apply various uh, micronutrient fertilizers. Most of the time, when we look at these micronutrients, sometimes we do have, we include these micronutrients with macronutrient fertilizers. So the inclusion of that is whether it is uh, the efficient or not, it is mostly a decision made by practical uh, reasons. One thing like the physical characteristics, and then the other thing is it is easy to apply micronutrients when you do have 
uh, those micronutrients included in with macronutrients. But if you are looking at the, the, the efficiency wise, the, uh, you will see that that's not a good idea. Here, this, this example is from South Australia again, uh, showing that the sub, uh, stubble where no sink was applied that has a dirty gray appearance compared with the stubble with which sink was applied and then the sink deficient crops, how they looked at in late in ripening. And then the, the again, I, I, I talk about this inclusion of sink in commercial macronutrient fertilizers. In here in South Australia, this in ca the calcareous soils, again, it was shown that the application of micronutrient as liquid is actually better than applying those as a granular fertilizers. Over here, the example is showing that comparing granular monoammonium phosphate uh, with zinc incorporated and fluid monoammonium phosphate and zinc mix, and showing here with the micro XRF, synchrotron based micro XRF map, when you add these granular zinc incorporated monoammonium phosphate into a soil like calcareous soil, where I talk about this water movement and then the restricting the dissolved nutrients going out and precipitation reactions happen. Over here, you can see that the nothing, almost nothing in this thing granule actually moved out after five weeks. And whereas when you are looking at the fluid fertilizer added one, you can see that it diffuses as it would like normally. So again, showing that suggesting that there can be, uh, there are things that we can do depending on soil we use them we, uh, to enhance the efficiency. And the, another traditionally, another method we use is use of chelates to enhance micronutrient de delivery. So the use uh, the small, uh, so the, what are the chelates? So the, those are small organic molecules that complex with micronutrients and other metals, especially that I am talking about chelates that we use in uh, the agriculture with the micronutrient fertility. So it alters the charge of the metal so that it changes the fate of uh, uh, these micronutrient in biological system. In addition to that, chelate can, actually it offers opportunity for soil micronutrient mining. If you are thinking about natural root exudates, has creating ability and how grasses and some other species survive in iron deficient and zinc deficient environment. So that is through chelation. So here it is showing that the, how this, uh, taking zinc as an example again, how this zinc chelate bound, changing the charge of it and changing uh, because of that, there's electrostatic repulsions, they stay in solution so that can be taken up by plants and microorganisms. So the, this uh, particular study is uh, over here, listed over there, using a ramnolipid, a biosurfactant, microbially derived biosurfactant, increasing dry matter production and sink concentration in durum and, uh, uh, durum and bread beet shoots. So to summarize, um, it, it's, it's not easy as it says, and there's no one uh, like uh, fits all solutions, but there are opportunities to design new or better sources of plant nutrients. And when we are doing that, we need to keep in mind that they will need to be affordable to produce and transport, and they should be able to furnish nutrients to soil solution in a manner well synchronized with crop demand. And then also it is clear that thorough understanding of soil chemical, biological and physical pro uh, properties and processes, as well as plant processes, those are going to help us to design more efficient fertilizers. So with that, thank you for listening. And any questions? Anga, thank you very much. Um, uh, interesting talk on uh, on nutrients and inhibitors. Um, uh, are there any questions for Ganga? I'm I'm watching the chat now, or uh, feel free to just pop on and and ask a question.
<laughs> Thank you very much for a, a fantastic presentation. Um, I'll, I'll start, I'll break the ice here. You really caught my attention with the smart fertilizers. Mm -hmm. How far away are we from seeing that in the commercial space? Is, is it mostly theoretical? I think the part of it is when I was talking about co crystals too, I mentioned that partly I think the cost, cost associated. So some of these can be cost prohibitive. However, if we can find these kind of coatings that are like cheaper and still doing what we wanted to uh, do, then I think we will be, uh, you know, th then, then we can uh, commercialize those. So as far as I know that there are no, uh, uh, other than specialty fertilizers, I don't think we have a, like a huge market yet. So I think the cost could be the uh, could be a reason. Did I answer your question, Bradley? Yes, that, that's helpful. I, mean, I know that's all kind of kind of speculation for where it goes, but it gives me a sense for what stage we're at. Yeah. Uh, so there are studies like those examples I had over there. So there are studies that showing the efficiency of it. And then sometimes those are very short term studies and not done in field or things like that. So, so I think uh, uh, it's exciting and then ex exciting in a way that since they are responsive to changing pH and if you think about whether we can uh, have things uh, uh, dissolving when pH is low, when it comes to rhizosphere or something like that when roots are near. So, so there, there are like exciting theoretical possibilities that one can try to uh, see whether we can get it to work. Um, I, I have a question here, mm -hmm. Matt. Yes. Um, we know that availability of nutrient highly controlled by many different factors, among them soil pH. Yes. What's the, from your observation, from your research, that different organic matter content influence the availability or solubility of these different nutrients, namely phosphorus, potassium, or micronutrients yeah so the uh, the effects can be like again depends on nutrients and depends on soil so if you're if you're thinking about organic uh, matter how they influence and sometimes those interactions could be uh, could have influenced in negative way but at the same time sometimes those interactions may make it later on release when plant needed. So it can be positive, uh, the interaction between nutrients and the organic matter. And then the other thing that the organic matter can have positive negative impact, especially dissolved organic carbon can have positive negative in, impact on the, the uh, enzyme activities. So the, the, for the nitrogen cycle. So mm -hmm. the, if we look at the, uh, the uh, urea hydrolysis, mm -hmm. so the urea enzyme, so that activity can be influenced by organic matter content. So okay. the higher organic matter, you, will, you may see that the higher activity. And uh, uh, so uh, that kind of, and then the other thing with uh, organic matter, the, um, the newer understanding of the new <clears throat> what's going on, actually incorporating some of these organic matter with nitrogen uh, fertilizers so the idea over there is with that uh, having carbon in there actually trigger the, the short-term immobilization of applied nitrogen. Mm -hmm. And then uh, thereby at least part of applied nitrogen, thereby mm -hmm. reduce uh, inorganic nitrogen losses. And then uh, the, again, expecting uh, uh, that to mineralize and release that for plant to take up. Okay. So I, I, yeah, there are opportunities with the, <clears throat> uh, 
the organic matter, we cannot really, uh, you know, ignore the impact of uh, organic matter. And then the organic matter can influence by buffering soil pH as well. Right. Yeah. yeah. With my experience, what we see with, especially with phosphorus fertilizers, it seems like the, uh, when we have calcareous soil, it is advantageous to get phosphorus to move as much as possible. But if we have acidic, highly weathered acidic iron aluminum uh, rich soil, uh, oxide rich soils, mm -hmm. it's not advantageous to actually get phosphorus to move. So mm -hmm. what happened is it will, if we get more, uh, the, the P move to like a greater soil volume, then we will see more and more chemisorption. And then the phosphorus is going to be like absorbed and not available for plant or not extractable. Mm -hmm. So in that case, in acid soils, it seems like the keeping phosphorus one in one place can be beneficial. Mm -hmm. okay. So again, Could, we, yeah, if, if I may follow up and uh, that's very interesting you know, concept, because when we look at the antagonistic effect be between nutrient availability and the buffer capacity of the soil, that might influence also by the microbial activity, especially within close proximity to the rhizosphere. What's your thought on that? Yeah. How it is going to influence by microbial right. activity? Right. Um, yeah. So the, the so again, um, effects can be both like beneficial and uh, not beneficial, isn't mm -hmm. it? Because if you have immobilization type of reactions, then then that might be at least temporary going to immobilize those available nitrogen. But, but if you are thinking about that, it is actually helping to mineralize more of those nutrients in the rhizosphere. So that can be beneficial that way. I think the, in the rhizosphere, if you think about what, what, what's the benefit of microorganisms, I, uh, it's not something that I, I uh, do study, but I do think that uh, it's probably is very complicated. <laughs> you know, like unraveling right. can be very complicated. Right. The, the effect can be multiple. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, there's another question I, I think you may have partially answered with your response about organic matter, but uh, from Michael Thompson, he asks, uh, might there be potential in treating crop residues uh, with either chemicals or microbes to either speed up or slow down mineralization of N or P. Yeah, so, so I, um, let me see whether I understood the um, question. That is like uh, the almost like the similar to having fulvic acid or something with fertilizers, or is it talking about the soil organic matter? Would you care to elaborate, uh, Michael, about, about your question? Or if I could get myself unmuted here, I'm thinking about um, crop residues that are left in the field um, that in some cases we might want them to be mineralized very fast. Other cases, we might want the mineralization process to slow down. And so I'm wondering about amendments directly to the crop residues. That we can do to uh, slow down. So you know that the as we talk about like mineralization, so we do have this carbon to nitrogen ratio, carbon to uh, sulfur ratio, carbon to P ratio, that we think that this, this is the limit where it's going to decide whether it is going to be mineralized or whether it is going to be mobilized. So there can be opportunities actually with that. So like I said about that, the, uh, the people considering actually adding nitrogen fertilizers with the organic uh, carbon. So the idea over there is having organic carbon they, uh, with that nitrogen fertilizer 
So carbon and nitrogen, so immobilize that added portion of that added nitrogen temporary and then get, get it to release. So I think they, they, with cover crops and then thinking about crop residues and things like that, there can be opportunities like that too. And then the other thing with uh, the organic matter or the, the root exudates or dissolved organic carbon, uh, they could help to mine micronutrients for sure. So that possibility is there because they, they, they could increase solubility of native like soil uh, micronutrient via complexation or ligand promoted dissolution. Mm -hmm. So that can happen even with uh, uh, the precipitated phosphorus as well. Mm -hmm. so, so I do think that they are, they, they are I, that is not something I have thought about before, you know, but now thinking about it after you ask that question, I think we can, for something like that, we should look into the, the ratios we want to have so that it will uh, do what we want it to do. Mm. Do we want it to be temporarily mobilized? Or if that's what our uh, target, or we, uh, we want it to be mineralized? Yeah, okay, thank you very much. Uh, there's uh, one last question in the chat here from Valeria, and she asks, uh, in terms of the application process of the solutions uh, that you're referring to, which do you find the most effective in terms of yield outputs? So, so, so the most of the time, the if it is uh, liquid fertilizers, application is almost always like we do the like a bandy. So most of the time, it's not like a uniform application. Um, so the, uh, the, the results I showed over there, actually, again, it, 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 from that South Australia yield increase of like the, uh, I think it was from five to 20 percent, that yield increase, they got it from just applying, it's like a band, not, 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 not in different way. But to um, answer your question, like thinking about how the application method can influence, like I said, related to, especially related to phosphorus, the, the uh, banding can be beneficial, uh, especially for uh, acid soils. And then the, if, you, if you do a, like a, a uniform application or broadcast, that can be, uh, that can trigger more sorption reactions especially if you are applying to highly weathered uh, acid uh, so, uh, soils, low pH soils, where phosphorus can quickly uh, adsorb by iron and aluminum oxyhydroxides. So the, uh, if, if it is a soil like high pH calcareous soils, better, you, uh, uh, better to apply it, if, if it is possible, better to apply it like a broadcast so that you avoid precipitation reactions. You avoid chances of breaching supersaturation, so calcium P is starting to precipitate. Thank you, and I have a follow-up question, if you don't mind. Please go ahead. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm asking, because I really wanted to ask the follow-up question more, but in terms of like seed treatments, do you think that smart fertilizers could be a potential for that? Um, because then you would reduce like the like the mechanical like wear that you would have on the soils, and so um, you would just have the the one you did when you're planting, right? So, do you see that as a potential for the smart fertilizers? Yeah, if it is really slow releasing, yes. But at the same time, uh, um, yeah, I think yes, definitely, uh, it will be beneficial than just adding um, without that. Because as, uh, mm -hmm. if you're thinking about the uh, ammonium and those kind of fertilizers adding with seed, mostly we, we are worried about the, the toxic effect of that. So if it is a slow releasing fertilizer, yes, that can be advantageous. Theoretically, I can see the advantages of having something like that protected and slow release so that it will be released 
slowly later on without actually interfering with the, the inhibiting seed growth. Thank you. I think smart fertilizer idea is really good. So those are things that maybe uh, graduate students can think of and you know explore. Uh, uh, it, it's really exciting to see whether like um, whether we can make these cool things so that they are responsive either to like pH change or when water is there or something like that. Uh, so, so yeah, there, there's great potential. Okay, well, Ganga, thank you very much for the, for the informative presentation. This was really great. Um, uh, just one last thing to let everybody know before we let you go. Uh, heads up for next week, um, Rachel Owen will be presenting. Her title is uh, Growing the Reach of Soil Science Through Policy Engagement. So we'll, we'll see everybody next week.